Uh, so welcome. Uh, my name is Joel Burton, and I'm very pleased to have been asked to host this afternoon session on hockey writing. Uh, with sports journalist uh, Stephen Brunt and Randall Max, whose volume Night Work, I'm also pleased to say, was just re-released this year in its 10th anniversary edition. If you haven't picked up this book, you, you really must. It's a gem of a book, relatable but challenging, and I should add, just made into a feature film, Goalie, and made by his daughters, no less. In speaking of the night, uh, as captured in the title of Night Work, I wanted to say quickly that I'm here, after arriving in London some years ago, to study English at Western, literally in the dark of the night, not knowing much about the city. Emerging from the dark, I traveled downtown, near this museum, then Weldon Library, to get a sense of this place. And one thing made an immediate impression. First in the streets, and then in what I read. It was the yellow brick of the homes and buildings. So I'll return to this image. You see, I moved here from Halifax, with all its painted wood buildings, to study literary theory. That is, to study ideas that allowed me to look more closely at literature. At the time, not fully appreciating the history of professors in English who contributed so greatly to the arts in Canada. It is worth noting here that the word theory, as in literary theory, is from the Greek for spectator, which posits looking as central, like theater, looking closer, looking differently, dark to light. So visiting us here are two writers trained in literary studies, who look, lucky for us have turned their eye toward looking at sports closely and differently in a social context, enlightening us spectators, I would add. First, poet Randall Max, here all the way from Corner Brook, Newfoundland, who in night work, the Sawchuck's poems, brings his insight as a poet critic to the topic of the NHL in the 1950s and 1960s, taking a closer look at the goalie, and I would add tragic figure, of Terry Sawchuck. He captures our imagination here as a wounded warrior, recreating the game in his image. Second, coming from the 401 by way of the 403, <laughs> Hamilton's own Stephen Brunt, now, this is the same Stephen Brunt who you read in the 80s as a music critic for the Western Gazette. The same Stephen Brunt you read in the London Free Press, and of course, after, as a celebrated sports writer at the Globe. And to my mind, to this day, brings an investigative lens to looking differently at sports in our society, like he continues to do on TV, but also in sports biographies, like Searching for Bobby Orr. So at WordsFest, we're here to celebrate the shared acts of writing and reading, which in this case involves looking for Sacha and searching for Orr. What we're also doing at Words is trying to remember together how this place, this city, and this region continues to contribute to the arts. We remember Mr. Brunt started to spill ink here at the Gazette and then the Free Press, while brick books with over a 40 year history here in our city, is the publisher for Mr. Max. So earlier, I mentioned the yellow brick that makes up so much of the built heritage of this area. It struck me as different at the time, as standing out. And I've since learned, of course, it is very much of this place. It's the brick of brick books, and I wasn't alone in my regard. So picture me lost in London, uh, lost in the library, and I find brick a precursor to Brick Books. Again, the publisher for Mr. Mags, founded by his friends in London in 1975. His friends and now literary luminaries, Stan Draglin and Don Mackay, then professors of English at Western, and now both living in Newfoundland. Lost in the stacks, I open up the first volume of Brick to see Stan Draglin, St Stan Draglin writing that I quote, London, Ontario, is white brick to me, or yellow brick, depending on who describes it. He then reports, summer of 1970, I found myself taking pictures of brick walls in downtown London. 
I found myself getting closer and closer to the walls, ending up as close, three and a half feet, as my camera would go. What happens when you get close to white brick? You start to see the colors that disappear in the distance, he says. Pastels, green, pink, red, <coughs> orange, brown. You notice the different textures, new brick, weathered brick, crumbling brick, painted brick. As Dragon's story illustrates to us so clearly, it is often in artful responses to the world around us, like his taking pictures, that we're able to see what we simply cannot at a distance. And so, writing, words, they also magnify, allowing us to look closer at subjects, and sports is one of those subjects that is made up of a multitude of colors and textures demanding a response from us as spectators. So please join me in welcoming Stephen Brunt and Randall Maggs, who are here to look closer. Welcome. So uh, last night at the opening panel for Words, uh, our artistic director uh, hosted a panel. Lisa Moore was uh, on that panel. And he was uh, suggesting through previous visits uh, of, of, of people who traveled from Newfoundland to be at this festival, to be in this museum, uh, Robert Chafe, uh, Jillian Kiley, and last year, uh, Wayne Johnson. And uh, Josh hesitated at the end and he said, I think what I'm really positing is that all Newfoundlanders know each other. So what I want to start with maybe, and I know you both have, uh, have uh, uh, lived in Newfoundland in the case of, of Randall, and summered in Newfoundland in the case of, of Stephen, but maybe I could just start with uh, pulling out some threads that I was uh, trying to express in the introduction. And maybe, Randall, we'll start with you. And maybe, how do you know Stan Draglin? And maybe uh, a follow-up question to that to bring it closer to home. Uh, how did maybe Newfoundland bring you and Stephen Brunt together as friends and, uh, and, and colleagues and collaborators? Uh, Stan, Stan, uh, I, I, I'm not sure where I met him first. It was Don Mackay that I have known for a long time, and I, I, that was kind of interesting. He, uh, Don had come to Cornerbrook to do a reading uh, the, just a few days before he won the Governor General's Award for the first time, and then he went on to Burnaby, uh, Vancouver, to read the next week. Well, I, I'm not a native Newfoundlander, but I've lived there about 40 years. My home <laughs> is Vancouver. And so I heard him read at Grenfell College at Cornerbrook. I brought him in, as a matter of fact. And in the following week, he was reading in Burmese. Well, I had gone home to see my mother. So there I was a week later, sitting in the front row, watching him again. And he started to talk, and he looked down at me, and he saw me there, and he said, what fucking coast am I on here? <laughs> <laughs> so we went, it was a Sunday night. I don't know if you ever tried to find a bar in New Westminster on a, open on a Sunday. We find, finally found one. And I, we got to talking, and I, I uh, mentioned this, I had this experience. Uh, I'd used, written a poem about Sachek as a metaphor for having moved from the west to the east. The first poem was, not, you know, I didn't set out to write a hockey book. Yeah, right. And I mentioned it to, the mic over that way. pardon me? Just directly in front of your face. Yeah. Okay. I mentioned it to, uh, to uh, Don, and uh, he liked the idea, and it just kind of went on from there. And Stan I met, of course, when he was doing the editing. Okay. And was I right to assume that Newfoundland brought, brought you and Stephen together? Yes, it, yes it did. Uh, Stephen I can tell, talk about that. Yeah, we were trying to put that back together today, weren't we, Randy? <laughs> I, I, I met Randy's son first, uh, David Manx, who's a, a remarkably talented musician, um, and uh, among other things. And he runs a, a festival called Grosmore and Summer Music in, in and around Cornerbrook and Woody Point and places. Woody Point's where, where I live in there a couple months of the year. Um, and, and he, I think I, I, it was David who first told me about the Sawchuck poems, which were then a work in progress, and I was working on this book. Um, so these books are published within a couple of years of each other. And, uh, and, I, and then that's how Randy and I connected. And I, I, I was doing, a, I was also editing a collection of Canadian sports writing called The Way It Looks From Here. There it is. <laughs> and um, they gave me complete free reign to do whatever I wanted. It was kind of, uh, right. which is lovely sometimes. So I could, it didn't have to be, sports writing, the kind of sports writing that I was doing in a newspaper, it could be anything. So um, I, I tried to broaden it, and I love the idea of, of including poetry, and especially this poetry. Um, so I included a couple of Randy's poems in the book, which... Three. 
Yeah, three, yeah, so that's just, just to be exact, three. And um, yeah, it was kind of, uh, I, I think, uh, w well, it's an amazing book. You know, you can read, if you've got a copy, I think my blurb is still on there, what I wrote about it at the time, and I, and I believe it. I think it, it, it I think the, the, through poetry, Randall reaches, you know, a, a deeper truth about the game and about the people in the game than, than, uh, than you can through prose or through, uh, through nonfiction, through any of the kind of ways we normally attack hockey. It is, uh, you know, and part of that is because of the process. You know, Randall actually went out and talked to those people, and it, it's it's investigative poetry in a lot of ways, which which I love. You know, as a as a reporter, I love the idea. So um, yeah, we hit it off. So we kind of traded off work with each other and um, read each other's work, and and then we we've, we've read together a bunch of times now. So these there's a kind of a synergy between these two books. That's that's lovely. Um, I anticipated maybe you going there, and, and I thought it'd be worth uh, reading just a, a passage from your introduction. And this is uh, the way it looks from here. Uh, it's a really great, really fantastic book. Um, so, so Stephen says, and this is a real, real compliment. And maybe Stephen, I could ask you to dig a bit deeper about maybe exactly what it is. But perhaps more than anything in this volume, they get at the essence of the athlete. So, so the poems of competition and of hockey culture, which by extension can only be our culture. Writing about sports for 20 years. I wouldn't claim to really know any of my subject, but after reading Mags's poems, I feel a profound connection to someone I never met. Yeah, it's look, it's uh, I, I, I was right. I, I, yeah, I know that's that's exactly how I feel. It's how I still feel. It, it you know, most of the Let way. Let me just say this, and we reinforce our friendship and partnership regularly at Woody Point yeah, we do. and at Rodney's Oyster House in Toronto. Yeah, we, which we're going to do this, this week coming up when we get together. It's going to be great. Now, I, I think it, it looks so much of what, you know, as, as someone who covered sport and then, had to, and then learned to kind of step back and write about it in a different way. But the coverage of sport, we, you know, you, you, it's who won, who lost, who scored, how it happened, the after game quote in the dressing room, the profile, the potted profile, that's, that's, that was our stock and trade. And, um, you know, athletes over time have become slicker and more programmed and more media trained, and so even, there's not even an ounce of blood in that anymore. There's no there's no truth in it anymore. Right. But you know, and and you know, people know. I think I think people understand the soft. You know Terry Sawchuk's name, and they knew the story. And if you're of a certain age, you knew him as a player, and you knew that he came to an unfortunate end. The you know the kind of darkness at the end of the Sawchuk story. But I I thought. Again, I think that what Randall did with, in the writing and in, and, and in what led up to the writing was an ability to kind of drill down into character and motivation and, you know, I, I, I know we talk a lot, we're talking a lot about place, about place and time. Um, it, like, no one who wrote about Terry Sawchuk as a contemporary, you, you know, and that's including some of the greatest sports writers in history, the Scott Youngs and the Jim Coleman's and the Milt Donnells, all people who covered him. Did, none of them got as close to Terry Sawchuk as Randall did. Uh, can I just just say, I, you know, I never uh, thought about this as investigative, but I guess, you know, that's absolutely what it was. And it produced some, uh, I, I, it was marvelous to talk to a lot of these old players. They were different than the, the modern players. But I got to say, there were some hilarious moments too. I mean, I don't know if you can imagine trying to talk to Ted Lindsay, uh, telling him you want to write a poem about him. You know? <laughs> Or, or Gump, or Gump Worsley, you know. I, I, I said to I said to Gump once, you know, I'm I'm do, working on this book uh, of, of, about the old goaltenders from the old, you know, from the uh, golden age of goaltending, and I wanted to talk to you and and uh, uh, I mentioned some of the others, and then I mentioned Jacques Plante. And Worsley looked at me and said, "You're going to have a hell of a time talking to Plante." <laughs> he was dead at the time. So, but or even just phoning up Ted, I phoned up Ted Lindsay out of the blue, and you got to go real quick over the word poetry. I'm working on a book of poetry about, uh, I was actually talking to his wife and she burst out laughing. You know, I thought, oh, oh my God, what's this, this going to be like? You know, and then she apologized quickly. She says, I don't know if he'll talk to you or not, but he did and he came on. It was wonderful. They were all great. It, it just was, uh, I think, not something they were expecting. So, uh, yeah, investigative. It, it, it was without even thinking about that term. That's great. Yeah, that's captured in the, uh, the new 10th edition, which I really do, uh, encourage you to, to pick up, uh, but in the intro, uh, it says it's an unlikely book, nearly 200 pages, mostly poetry about a single hockey player. So when you, when you enter this, you're, you think you're maybe entering uh, one world, but you enter 
another one very quickly. Um, it, it's one made of uh, um, multiple documents that, that support and, and paint a picture of Sachak, um, uh, composed of, of many interviews um, with the referee, like Red Story. Um, uh, a lot of the research you've done, uh, pictures included, um, and even beginning with uh, the autopsy of, of Cherry Sachak, which is which quite profound and, and moving. So uh, I recommend it. But for now, we should we should hear from these authors. So they're going to take the podium, and uh, I think they have something worked out, choreographed. They even said so. There could be dancing. Loosely choreographed, I would say. Loosely choreographed. Yeah, I think I'm on the right wing here. <laughs> Yeah, so, so please uh, uh, take the podium and, and please share. All right. Yep. Meditation on the puck. Chiaro scuro. Press one flat against your face, even in summer. You feel its winterness. Toss it up and down, its edges hit bone. A puck seems leaden in the hand, a dead weight, nothing like the subtle baseball with its endlessness. Its pendulous invitation, its pair of eights that curl together in a perfect sphere. Baseball. The game says grass and crackling heat. The word allows the tongue to linger. You want to heft a baseball in your hand, roll it across your fingers and ponder who to let in on its secrets. Alignment of seams, angle of elbow. This is how you grip the sinker. Here's the knuckleball, le papillon. Even those Frenchmen, mad for hockey, get dreamy contemplating the curve and dip, the pitch's erotic path. A baseball's hot to trot, flat and squat, Puck's inert, needs a lever, needs ice. Perry Sound. On the river, he could skate forever. No barrier but the banks and the horizon, the ice stretching far out onto the bay. Soon enough, the cold seemed to disappear, even for the boy who always insisted on lacing up barefoot. It just felt better, more natural that way. Take the puck and try to hold it. Keep away. Offer it up, then pull it back. Put it behind the blade, make it disappear. Sleight of hand, sleight of feet. Learn to keep your head up, your eyes forward. Feel the puck on your stick, don't look down. Speed up, change direction. The motion natural, deceptive, economical, graceful. No churning legs or labored strides, even on beat up secondhand skates. He is smaller than the rest, a skinny kid. Scrawny, no meat on his bones at all. But they can't get near him, even though it looks as if he isn't working hard, as if he is shifting through the gears and automatic. One speed, then another, then another. Size and muscle are of no use, without corners, without ends, without limits. There are no coaches standing by waiting to impose their will. No parents shouting at the side. No drills, no repetition, but rather, Every rush is an improvisation, a jazz solo, a flight of the imagination. And when the boy is clear of them all, or alone by choice, when all he faces is open ice, the other sounds of his world disappear. The intermittent hum of small town traffic, the rumble of distant factories, the angry shouts at home. Just the scrape and, and gouge of metal on ice, the rhythmic tap of rubber on wood, on, on forever. Pick a direction and keep on going, and eventually there's no one in the way. The famous crouch is Terry thinking back on how he became a goaltender. A fierce moon at the window, hunting boys. An attic room my brother shared with me, the good warmth diving under quilts on winter nights, four steps from the bucket to the bed laughing in the dark at how old goalies held their sticks, all knuckled up and how they combed their hair. I'd tell Mitch that he was mental playing goal, but always helped to scrape the ice before he played, then stamp a flat spot on the bank behind him, changing ends when he changed ends. Terry, 
Keep your fingers off the screen, he'd warned me, once he kicked the puck away. He clasped his hands behind his head, they said, behind his desk at work that day and stretched and yawned, content. He'd shut out St. Vital the night before, and he'd seen Corinne Winnick in the crowd. And smiling, cocked his head to make a final point, they said, half rose, and then pitched forward on his face. All those nights I'd hear him in his sleep, stay low, stay forward, balance on a ball, forget the name as they sing you through the screen, see the shot before it leaves the stick. Such preparedness I'd lie awake and think. And so I got accustomed to the view from here. You watch them come at you in waves and watch them fly away. In my dreams he plunges after the puck then turns to find me grabbing at the screen. But now it's me who's bending low and looking for the bullet shot. All my life I'd heard the warning in his voice, but in the moment's heat, I hear it yet. A memory. Rich was a confirmed bachelor. They existed then, without irony, without, question, without quotation marks, at least so it seemed. He lived with his mother in a small square red brick house on a quiet city street in a humble neighborhood of a working class city. There must have been more to him than that, it's a backstory of some sort, but perhaps I was just too young to have heard. What I do remember was that he was tall and raked thin, that he was an exercise buff at a time when that would have set him apart from his peers in the days when, the only when only the muscle man Jack LaLanne doing jumping jacks on the old black and white represented anything resembling a fitness culture. That he worked for the same people as my father did, performing some vaguely actuarial function on a different floor of the grand old hotel where the company had rented space. That, like so many childless people of a certain age whom I encountered in those years, he had a soft spot for kids. Years later, they'd find Reg dead in the office, slumped over his desk one afternoon. My father, who though he mostly loved his work, had a romantic resistance to the wage slave's life, always thought that was an awful way to go, on the job. The phone rang at home, and when, when, when my mother picked it up, there was the sound of shock, then silence, which I already recognized as the sure sign of bad news being delivered. I have something sad to tell you, she said. Those first intima intimations of mortality stick with you. Beyond his looks and the day he died, what I remember most about Reg was a hockey game, the first one I ever saw in person. It was his idea. He was passionate about the sport in a way that, frankly, my father was not. It was forever unclear how and why that had happened, how a Canadian, or at least an American, who lived virtually his entire life in Canada, had resisted the siren song of the national game. The old man could skate a bit, and presumably had played at some point or another, growing up in the same small southwestern Ontario tobacco town, Simcoe, that had produced the great Leonard Red Kelly. But I never heard him mention it once, and he never cared much whether I could skate and shoot. Even the spectator side of the sport seemed to leave him cold. Football he loved, and he enjoyed the fights, and those I remember the neighborhood fathers gathering to watch on big boxy television sets. But the Saturday night ritual that seemed to captivate every other Canadian passed our house over. For us, hockey was more of a sometime thing. And that's saying something. Since in that time, in that country, in that sports world, the opportunities to actually see a game were so limited to begin with. The National Hockey League on television was on view only those winter Saturday nights. Baseball came our way just on Saturday afternoons from an American network. There were occasional Canadian Football League games, and on Sundays in the fall, the National Football League or the American Football League, the New York Giants, the Cleveland Browns, or the Buffalo Bills. Even that, for most of Canada, represented an unbelievably rich smorgasbord. Border towns, or at least those within antenna distance, could add content from the US channel, from three US channels networks. The, the rest of Canada was limited to the state broadcaster, the CBC. One station, all the time, beaming the perspective of downtown Toronto from sea to sea, whether the rest of the nation wanted it or not. Hockey Night in Canada was its most famous property but there was other stuff as well. Don Messer's Jubilee, the variety show starring our pet Juliet, the kids' shows, 
the friendly giant, and Razzle Dazzle and Shaolin. Canada then seemed a quiet, square place. The civil rights marches in the Vietnam War were evening news exotica. The greater cares of the world apparently distant, though for a few fleeting moments, my parents did wonder whether they ought to build a fallout shelter in the backyard. To their generation, for whom a world war was a fresh experience, for whom the depression shaped core values, those placid boom times were a blessing. They were also, it turned out, the calm before a social storm. What I remember most when it comes to hockey are my father's strong dislikes, one of which was the Toronto centricity that the rest of the country was forced to endure. Somehow, though he'd spent many hours in the great metropolis visiting his beloved grandfather, the Major, a dramatic, brilliant, florid Englishman prone to extreme financial highs and lows, my father loathed the Toronto Maple Leafs and everything he believed they stood for. It wasn't so much that he was a Habs fan or a Red Wings fan, or something positive that would fully explain the negative. He just hated the whole notion that the country's beating heart could be found in the yellow brick temple on Carlton Street, that it was the Leafs and everyone else. Years later, when the suit and tie crowd at the gardens, so knowledgeable, so dignified, took to booing a brilliant young Boston defenseman every time he touched the puck, my, my father regarded that as definitive proof of, of the soundness of his anti-Hogtown prejudices. He also hated Foster Hewitt, the great icon of Canadian sports broadcasting, the voice of hockey, first on radio and then on television, the man who invented the phrase, he shoots, he scores. My father claimed he sounded like a pig. <laughs> Not knowing exactly what a pig would sound like doing hockey play-by-play, -play, I thought that still seemed reasonable enough. And as for rooting interests, I admit to considerable confusion. If you lived in English Canada and didn't love the Leafs in the early 1960s, you were out of luck on a couple of fronts. One, they were very good and seemed to win the Stanley Cup pretty much annually. And two, in every way that mattered, there was only one home team. When the games came on television, the first period and part of the second already completed, had to protect the live gate for the, for the team's proprietors. The score mysterious until Foster or his son and successor Bill Hewitt delivered the news. It was always the Maple Leafs versus somebody. Of the five available somebodies, you understood that the Habs were also pretty darn good, though awfully French, that the Red Wings were a mere <laughs> shadow of the great team of the 50s and that Gordie Howe was already old, that the Blackhawks employed the most glamorous young star in the game, Bobby Hull, and seemed like the vanguard of a new era, and that the New York Rangers, and especially the Boston Bruins, were usually terrible. How you could be usually terrible in a 16 league, how you could go decades without winning a Stanley Cup was a mystery that flew in the face of all theories of logic and probability, but that's the way it was. The athletes, not just in hockey but in all sports, were a collection of crew-cut heads on bubblegum cards, the subjects of heroic profiles in the sports pages and the few specialty magazines that turned up in the drugstore. Far-fetched was the notion that an athlete could be part of the nascent 1960s counterculture. That possibility didn't dawn on anyone until Cassius Clay beat Sonny Liston and then told the world he'd rather be called Muhammad Ali. And it wasn't until the arrival of Joe Namath that a sports star possessed the kind of attractive, cutting-edge, sexy danger normally associated with movie stars or musicians. Professional athletes instead represented and reinforced the status quo. Whether or not that was true, whether or not that was their choice, whether or not that was who they really were. In hockey, it wasn't so hard in the 16 league to know the name of every player on every team. The no notion that athletes were in any way mercenary, that their loyals lay anywhere but with the crest on their chest, was an utterly alien concept. The players weren't organized in associations or unions, which greatly facilitated their exploitation by the owners. There were no agents. Those very few who held out for more money at the beginning of a season, never hockey players though, were regarded as greedy and ungrateful and unaware of the difference between real labor and being paid to play a kid's game. On the other end of the spectrum, money was very much the, the issue. The price of entry to see the heroes in action live and in person. Beyond television, the flesh and bones National Hockey League, the real thing, was for me distant and in most ways unimaginable. My town was within easy driving distance of Maple Leaf Gardens, but who had the dough? Who had the influential friends necessary to gain access to Saturday Night Hockey in Toronto? I didn't see the Leafs play a real live game until I was 21 years old when I moved to the city and could afford to buy my own ticket. If you said you were going to the hockey game, 
you meant the local rink, the forum, an old barn of a place down in the industrial east end close to the steel mills where the seats were wooden benches, where pillars obstructed the view, and where the local heroes, a junior team affiliated with the Detroit Red Wings, were the biggest game in town. So you might not see Frank Mahovlich, but there was his big hulking brother, Pete. You might not see Bobby Hull, but there was Dennis playing for St. Catharines, the lesser brothers league. That plus a host of local heroes whose names I can still remember, guys who today would have enjoyed long, prosperous NHL careers, but who in the 16 days perhaps were invited to one training cap, perhaps plied their trade in a far-flung outpost of the miners, and then returned to day jobs, dreaming of what might have been. So when kind Reg suggested to the old man that it was time to see, take his son to a hockey game, that's what he meant. Sure, he's awfully young, but you would get a kick out of it. It's an afternoon tilt, the tickets are cheap, a boy's day's out, day out. What a great and wonderful surprise. It gets blurry here, even as one of those memories that, as the years pass, you desperately hope to preserve or to resurrect. There were plenty of other games afterwards, but the only, only one that became part of family lore, the time that Reg took you to the rink, the time that you saw you know who. I've seen my own kids' first inklings of nostalgia, understanding the part that parental construction and family mythology play in the process. So much of what we remember is what we are told we must. But what is stuck, what I think is my own, are the colors of that afternoon, which in a world of black and white television were vivid beyond my imagining. That kind of great sensory overload that strikes me still walking into a sporting event. Not just the visuals, but the arena smell, though in the new antiseptic NHL buildings, they seem to have finally managed to mask it. The funk of sweat and popcorn, the blue haze of cigarette smoke in the corridors, the chill coming off the artificial ice, the sound of skates carving the ice, a tinny public address announcer standing for the anthem, the ritual, the costumes, which to a future exceptionally dedicated altar boy would always seem so much like the Catholic Mass. There is an image also of a kid player who to me certainly looked like a full grown man. Every time he stepped on the ice, which was often that day, I was told to keep an eye on number two, playing for the visiting Oshawa Generals a Boston Bruins farm team whose uniforms bore a variation on the spoke logo that has been reproduced by many a board student doodling on school notebooks. So many hockey players are blessed or cursed to carry boys' names for their entire lives, at least those that, unlike Wayne or Mario, could be easily reduced. Howe would never become Gordon, even when he was a playing grandfather. Hull was never Robert or even Bob. It was and is a game of Gordies and Mickeys and Dannys and Bobbies. Four, blonde crew cut Bobby who could take the puck behind his own net and skate through and past and around the other team. Bobby, who in the days when a young country seemed to be waking from a long nap, when a minor professional sport began to shake off the cobwebs and look to a new horizons, embodied the idea that it didn't have to be as it had always been. A defenseman who could take off, could improvise, could be so good that they'd let him defy every bit of conventional coaching wisdom. A skinny teenager could play among hardened, violent, resentful men and survive. A 60s guy, at least when he finally let his hair grow past his ears, could take the place of heroes who in their square, upright Canadianness, looked like your buddy's dad who worked down at the plant. Remember, Reg said, remember who it was you saw today. Remember so you can tell your own kids someday. Remember, for 50 years, I've tried my best. One of you. Catchers in baseball, closest to cousins in your differentness. The safeguarding home, the healing bones, the serious gear, which ought to indicate the possibilities. And only one of you. Denied the leap and dash up the ice, what goalies know is side to side, an inwardness of monk and cell. They scrape, they sweep. Their eyes are elsewhere as they contemplate their narrow place. Like saints, they pray for nothing which brings grace. Off days, what they want is space. They sit apart in bars. They know the length of streets in 20 cities, but it's their saving sense of irony 
that further isolates them as it saves. Percy H. Lesseur, for one. In a fitful sleep, flinching at rising shots in a bad light, rubbers flung out of the crowd, insults in two languages, finally got out of bed in a moment of bleak insight, went down and burnt a motto onto his stick, hec est manus que ictum deflesit. This is the hand that turns away the blow. Or Lauren Chabot, in 1928, when someone asked him why he always took the trouble to shave before a game, angled out a leg to check a strap and answered in, in a quiet voice, I stitch better when my skin is smooth. <laughs> or dapper Charlie Rayner, who stopped the bullet with his chin, another couple of teeth and some hasty work to close an ugly cut. Back the next night, he takes another full in the face. A second night in a row, he's down spitting bits of tooth to the ice. It's a wonder, he mutters, why somebody doesn't get hurt in this game. <laughs> January 6, 1998, courtroom mate, Federal Courthouse, Boston, Massachusetts. On the day the Eagle went down, old players filled most of the public seats in the Boston courtroom row upon row of hockey card faces attached to lumpy, unfamiliar bodies, fatter, grayer, deep lines cutting across old hide Florida tans. They were gathered to bear witness, to feel and revel in Alan Eagleson's pain, to see him humbled, to get something of themselves back, though not all of those desires would be satisfied in the end. Holding center stage, the American prosecutor was a handsome, blown dry self-promoter, a politician reveling in the spotlight as though he, this was his personal moment of triumph, as though he himself had brought the foreign shyster to justice. Truth was, the case in the United States, part of a carefully bargained cross-border deal, was a cheap little consolation prize. The Eagle would be in and out of jail in a few months, he'd be back living the life, splitting his time between Canada and England, secure in the knowledge that even as they were bringing him down, yanking his plaque out of the Hockey Hall of Fame, taking back his Order of Canada, his powerful friends had remained his powerful friends, and he hadn't been made a pariah at all. Al being Al, even in this dark moment, couldn't help but quietly schmooze with the reporters in the crowd before the legal ceremonies began. These were the boys who had once loved him best because he'd taken them around the world and treated them like kings and shown them one hell of a time. Al didn't have quite the same bluster or the same retinue. Back in the glory days, he'd arrive with a full entourage of sycophants shuffling behind in his wake. He'd own the room. He'd be overflowing with smiling, profane, fuck you confidence. Quieter now. Some small talk, a few harmless jokes, just to make some human contact. Just to convince himself that the old boy still had it. That eventually all of this would pass. How Bobby Orr slipped into the courtroom like a specter is one of those little mysteries, though it figured that if you were Bobby Orr in Boston, even long after the heroic nights of the garden had passed into memory. No back door was barred. No entrance was off limits. No one would dare say no, even in the hallowed halls of justice. The bailiff intoned, all rise. The judge walked to the bench, and suddenly there in the last row was the blonde moth, the boy's mug, unmistakable. He was three months short of 50 years old now. But to look at him, you would never have guessed it, or at least without seeing him try to walk on his old man's knees. And there was comfort in that. If number four wasn't aging, maybe the rest of us weren't aging either. Always carefully he picked his spots. He picked this spot in the Boston courthouse to finally publicly join his aggrieved hockey brethren. He knew that Eagleson would know he was there. He knew that Eagleson would feel the stare, would cast a sideways glance, but understood that the circle was now complete. Ora looked on as Eagleson stood for sentencing, as the lawyer's deal was made official. Guilty pleas on three counts of mail fraud, a million dollar fine and 18 months in jail to be served in a relatively comfy Canadian prison. Nothing more. Not really even much of a slap on the wrist. More a kiss. Though Eagleson and his friends argued and argue still that he could have won unconditionally if he'd chosen to fight the legal fight to the bitter end, but it would have cost him years and millions and he wanted to spare his family all of that. When the verdict was delivered, a voice rang out in the back of the courtroom not ours, of course. Thank God for the United States of America, Carl Brewer hollered, because this never would have occurred in Canada. 
The other players kept their thoughts to themselves, except for the few who muttered loudly enough, son of a bitch. All rose once more as the judge left the bench, then all eyes turned to the back of the room, especially the eyes of reporters, who had noticed the late arrival, who wanted desperately to know in this defining moment for him, for hockey, what was on his mind. But Bobby Orr was gone. Things in our day, the interviewer is first person talking to Gary Berkman. He had rabbit ears. You watch what you said before a game. As Gary Bergman speaks, his eyes take in the tables and the gloom, old defenseman's eyes. Some days he didn't care, but you never knew. And then that dreadful stuff he rubbed all over himself before he put on his gear, red something, red man, red devil, the stink of it, my God. What with that and the short fuse, the guys gave him and his gear a wide berth, and I wore number two, you understand. That was my number all the way up through minor hockey, but I never gave any thought to where it might land me one day. I get to Detroit and it hits me, geez, I'm dressing next to a legend. The guys were always bitching about that liniment, but I never opened my mouth. By the time I dipped my gear on though, my eyes would be tearing so bad, I'd have to grope my way toward the door. Oh man, he was a great one, but getting dressed in, next to him was no picnic. All the while I see He's carefully weighing the quiet that seems to have settled around us. There's not another white face in the bar, and his is as wide and bright as a harvest moon, much fuller than when I watched him play, and pale, and he shaved his head. That surprised me when he pulled up to the curb sunglasses and shaved head, even though uh, in his playing days his hair was fair and always pretty sparse. Nobody knows him now, he says. Who remembers a stay-at-home defenseman with no hair? He laughs and tells me that's been his salvation. It's given him a lot of freedom with his family. Half a Terry he said, surliness, he said, was only wanting to be left alone. He didn't like the limelight. Fans all over you wanting to sit at your table and tell you how great you were. He knew how quick they turned when things weren't going so good. Bergman signals a waiter who seems in no hurry to come to our table. He's talking to me, but he's keeping one eye on the waiter. Yuki would give it right back to them, too. Boston was always the place we hated to play. Some of those fans, man, they'd take the hide right off you. To get to the ice, you had to go down this little strip of linoleum, and you knew what was waiting at the other end. And Terry had had his history there in Boston. They'd be on him even before the game began. One time he goes after someone, straight over the screen in his gear. We all converge on this big mouth about the same time. Yuki, the cops, and the rest of the guys, what a scramble in the seats, people trying to get out of the way. One of the cops gets his shoes slashed open. He gives a little shake of his head, remembering. Everybody grabbing at everybody. The waiter brings menus and stands there waiting. We order and he leaves without a word. Bergman watches him go, then leans toward me. What are you doing in this part of town anyway, he asks. The university, I say. The Detroit papers on microfilm, microfiche. He looks at me. Microfiche? What the hell is that? <laughs> Do you think you'll find out about him from the newspapers? He hated those guys. He's quiet a moment, looking at me as if he's assessing how much of a dunce he's really talking to here. Sips at his water, then sets the glass down. You happen to notice nobody parks at a meter down here. You think that's just coincidence? Casually, the waiter slides her plates onto the table, pours coffee, and asks if there's anything else we want. No, have a good day from this guy. Bergman lifts a corner of the bread and says, more sauce would be nice. The waiter shrugs and brings him a bottle. Bergman coaxes a little out and looks at me. Do you want a Sawchuck story? Put that pen down. I'll give you a Sawchuck story, but you've got to look at me. He sets the sauce bottle out of the way, then moves a vase with plastic weeds from the center of the table. Things in our day were different. You understand? You go to a hockey game now and what do you get? Basketball music. Goalies? Geez, what do they look like? Guys from a bomb squad. <laughs> Something else. We always played an exhibition game against the farm team during the season. You know, bring in the big team for the local fans. You never knew when. So in 62 or 63, we're going pretty good. We're in the hunt and having fun and Terry and Gordy are playing like their old selves. 
There's one Saturday night, hey, you want to know how good those guys really were, he interrupts himself. One night before a really big game, a game we absolutely have to have, I'm getting dressed next to Terry, and I don't know how he's feeling, but I'm a wreck. And Gordy stops and asks him how he's doing. Pretty good, big guy, says Terry. Just get me a couple and we should be okay. Well, it was a battle that night, but we come out on top, and what do you think? We win the game, two to one. Gordy gets both goals, and Terry knocks down everything, but something he had no chance on at the end. When those two got to go on, man, I'm telling you. But that little chat they had before the game, whenever I think about it, I get the willies. Anyway, he looks at me a moment as if it was me who interrupted him. Anyway, this other night we got a big game up in Toronto, huge game, Saturday night, hockey night in Canada, the whole show, and they tell us we have to play another game the night before in Hamilton, Hamilton Red Wings, our junior team, and Yuki's penciled in for both games. Back-to-back -back games they want him to play so the fans in Hamilton get to see him. And here we are battling for a playoff spot. I mean, does that make sense? Terry, they say, it'll give you a little extra playing time. He's in the league then 13, 14 years. <coughs> playing time, he says. What the hell do I want with playing time? Bergman picks up his water glass and looks into it closely as if he'd been seeing something floating in it. So you know he's not too happy taking warm-up shots that night, waving at pucks. He shakes the glass and then puts it down without taking a drink. He shakes his head. He was a terrible practice goalie, anyhow. Anyone will tell you that. Wanted to save himself for the game, he'd say. Guy plays 20 years in Golden. Nobody else had lasted more than 11 before him. So maybe he wasn't so crazy. Anyhow, we knew enough to keep the puck down. Most of us were scared to death of him anyway. So here's these pumped up kids bouncing up and down at the other end and stealing looks at us. We're trying to work up a little interest and lobbing fat ones into his trapper or whacking them 10 feet wide off the boards or off the bricks. That building, whoever put it up didn't know much about hockey. That was easy to see. The boards were too high and flush against the pillars. Man, some harebrained kid runs you from behind. How easy would it be to lose your head? The walls at each end are brick too and tight against the boards. And over Terry's head, there's the biggest portrait of the queen you've ever seen. Painted right onto the brick, 15 feet by 20, easy. Ice hockey, I remember thinking. That's what she would have called it, right? You call it ice hockey, what do you know about the game? Am I right? Still, I'm looking into that steely gaze and thinking whatever she had going on in her head, you'd never know it looking at her eyes. Anyways, the guys are bored and someone flips a puck at her nose. And I get to thinking, what have we got to bitch about? Imagine being her with all those royal jerks around her and scandals and scumbag writers. Talk about no place to hide. And just then the ice goes dark and the lights go up on her for the anthem. It happens all of a sudden and Yuki turns around quickly wanting all this over with. And one of the boys had just ripped the long one toward the net and the puck sails through the dark and smacks Terry right behind the knee where he's got no padding. Oh Lord, I'm thinking, here we go. All you can <laughs> see against that lit up wall is Terry's silhouette. He just goes rigid like someone shot him from the stands, then sort of slithers down the goalpost to the ice. My mind is racing. All I can think, he's going to kill someone. One of his own guys, right in front of all these people, right in the middle of the national anthem. And then, don't ask me how it happens. I start to giggle. It's just terror, like when you're kids and you're laughing at the table and you know your old man's just about to blow his top, but you're helpless, man. You can't stop, right? And then I sense these darker shadows all around me. The guys are doubled over, holding on to one another. Then you see that silhouette of Terry slowly hauling himself up the post and flopping over the crossbar. Man, the guys just lose it. It's terrible, but no one can help it. I can see them in that weird light holding on to each other, collapsing on the ice together, laughing. Hysterical, that's what we were. And the eeriest thing about it all was it's all in complete silence, except for the crowd droning on, you know, send her victorious, happy and glorious. He stops and looks at me. Jesus, who writes crap? <laughs> Tell me you don't write crap like that. 
he catches my by surprise, and I have to stop myself from laughing. Then I think about your nerves before a game, guys rocking from skate to skate during the anthem. All you want to do is get things going, and every night that awful droning on and on. And I get a sudden rush of how much I'm enjoying Bergman and this place and our waiter, who's looking at us now, maybe a little amused, and everyone else is ignoring us altogether, some tentative seal of approval, maybe. So I say, I don't, I don't write stuff like that, Gary. Swear to God, and if I ever did, I'll never do it again. <laughs> he stares at me and shakes his head. Man, he says, that's embarrassing, even I know that. He picks at his french fries, which are cold by now, and looks at me. So anyway, hey, I told you, put that pen down. Anyway, there we are, and the anthem's getting near the end, and the guys are trying to get back on their feet before the light comes on. You hear this buzz in the crowd. They know something's going on. It's a nightmare, I'm telling you, and nobody's going to go near the goal to wish him luck. We're holding our breath, waiting to see what he'll do. Bergman sits back from the table and gives this little chuckle. You know what he does? He doesn't even look at us. Straight off the ice, he goes up the tunnel and into the dressing room. Doesn't say a word to anyone, the coach, the trainer, doesn't even slow down at the bench. Someone said, I bet he was into his third gin and tonic before the first period ended. Someone else said, yeah, he was moving pretty good for a guy with a bad leg. Bergman's quiet for a moment, looking at the water glass he's holding in both his hands. Yeah, you never knew. He could be a dark and scary guy, but you never knew. Took a lot of shots in his time. Sometimes, though, when things got really hot and heavy, we're hanging on for our lives, we're trying to kill a penalty in a game we need, and here comes their big line over the boards. That's when you see his eyes get really bright behind his mask. Delight and panic at the same time, maybe. Who could say? But that's when he was most alive, out on the ice with the game on the line. Even with all that cost him in the end. That's what I think anyway. Leaving the bar, we nod to the waiter, who turned out to be pretty friendly. Bergman pays an armed attendant at the parking lot and climbs into his car. Microfiche, he mutters. <laughs> what next? He looks up at me a moment and offers his hand out the window. You know, he said, before I came up, I had a year or two of university myself. In our day, you kept that kind of thing to yourself. <laughs> We're just about a time, uh, but the, the good, good news is uh, Stephen and Randall are going to join us outside here in the hallway to, to sign books. So maybe just one quick question just to keep wrapping things up here. Um, Stephen, if you open up the globe today, Bobby Orr. The perception of Bobby Orr, uh, the entry points into his story, why does he still mean something to us? Uh, it's, I think because, I think because we're a great chunk of the population, generationally, um, you know, came of age in that time, again, statistically, you know, my, my generation, the baby boom generation. And I think that moment, uh, you know, th the, the, the best players, the best athletes of your, your youth are the athletes you remember as the best players who ever lived. So if, if I had been 13 years old in the mid-1980s, or, or 10 years old in the mid-1980s, I, I probably, you know, and I, I've written about Wayne Gretzky, but I would feel that way about Wayne Gretzky. I think it's, 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 the, it's the power of myth, you know, and the power of memory, and, and I just see a bunch of, you know, I, I saw this, a photo book, right, the new war book. That, that's uh, right, by war. Yeah, he's still, he's still very mysterious, right? He still doesn't give a lot away, but... Um, yeah, but, but I think that's what... You your title searching. You yeah. You lose a figure. But I think that's what it is. I think it's, it's that... It's, it's the kind of, it's the, and it's not like every moment you can just pull up on your computer and say, here it is. Some of it's gone. A lot of it's gone. So it only exists here. I think that there's a power in that. In memory, which is yeah. where you start your book. So the last word to you, Randall. I know you spent you, you spent time and were uh, were you raised in Winnipeg? I know you said you're from Vancouver. Not raised, uh, not raised there. I was there for my teenage years. Yeah, uh, that's when I first saw Terry. Yeah, okay. we played on the same ice surface as him. We all knew. I mean, ten or fifteen years before, but we knew who put on that ice. So, so, so as a boy, why, why was it? Why was he so important? Um, even capturing your imagination as a poet, I think it. Uh, I think it just. It just kind of. It just kind of grew over the years. You know, I kind of forgot about him completely, and 
one day I was doing a reading in Saskatchewan, I went by the uh, gr grain elevators in a town called Floral, and I saw that word floral across the elevator, and it's just that, that for my generation, is the most famous birthplace of the greatest soccer player of the age, well, Gordy Howe, and it just brought everything back to me, and I just started thinking about that period, and recalling Terry, and this, his story, which is like the Titanic, it will never go away. I mean, it's such an in, incredibly amazing and gripping and tragic story. And as, as it exists in memory. So, so I think that's a good place to stop. Um, as, as we did in the beginning, beginning uh, could you please uh, um, say farewell to our authors here, uh, Stephen Brunt and Randall Maggs. And please join me in the hallway as well. Thank you so much.